some of the solutions that we think we need uh, going forward here as we advance into the 21st century. So, so let me just, just start by, by talking to you a little bit about the, the threats themselves. This, in, in fact, if we were to talk about the threats comprehensively, we could do it all day long and we could fill the chart full of, of, um, of words, but I'd like to just hit a few key elements that I think to pull the thread that I'd like to pull here this morning. First of all, there is a wide range within the, uh, the threat landscape that we face today, and it begins, on, I would call it on the low end, on the, on the terrorism end, uh, which of course continues, the threat has not gone away, it continues to grow and sometimes grow quietly, but some of the technologies that they are employing are particularly troubling. It's very difficult now for us to, to deal with some of the small UAVs, for example, the unmanned aerial vehicles that can be easily weaponized, can be built uh, quickly in a garage or ordered off of Amazon and deployed in the field and can quickly be set against uh, multi-million dollar radars, for example, and in a heartbeat, uh, a, a very small uh, particular weapon, uh, easy to build weapon, can take out major systems. So on one hand of the spectrum, we have these, these technology uh, endeavors that are, that are driving a threat for us to try and detect and destroy very cheaply uh, these, 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 um, these small devices. The other end, though, is the, what we would call maybe the emerging threats and the asymmetric threats. The most obvious of those are the hypersonic systems that some of our adversaries are building. Incredibly fast, again, incredibly hard to detect and track. It really doesn't take much to destroy them, much like the UAVs. They're moving so fast, you could throw up anything in front of them if you put it in the right place. But being able to track and follow those across wide regions is tremendously uh, challenging. So you have this range of threats now from the very small, uh, and, and within, uh, within anywhere within the world, to the, to the very, and, and, and easily deployed, and subtly deployed, and deployed with deniability, which we see in parts of the world, so you can claim that that UAV didn't come from us, to the other end of the spectrum, the hypersonic weapons, and it's pretty clear overtly who sends those when they fly, uh, but uh, we, have to, we have to deal with those nonetheless. And then to, to weave all that in is the, the military and economic fusion, if you will, and certainly uh, the, the integration of economics, politics, and, and the military might is not something that is new. But I would suggest to you that what some of our adversaries are doing today is perhaps just unprecedented and sophisticated beyond anything that we have seen. The ability to advance political goals through both civilian and military means is something that I think we have not seen uh, in the history of the world, and the, and the domains in which our adversaries are operating on are very, very broad. There is virtually no domain now uh, that, they are, that they are not uh, very proficient in, that they can challenge us in, and oftentimes that is, that is a done through disruption. So to take away whatever advantages we can bring to the battlefield, take it away through disruption, take it away through electronic warfare, uh, disrupting GPS, whatever it is, so this, this combination of threats uh, that, have, that have, have been emerging for some time, but frankly, over the course of the last two years, while, while most of us have been very focused on, on COVID and pandemic and recovery, our adversaries have continued to advance, uh, if, if not at the pace they've been going before, but I would say at an accelerated pace. This would bring us to consider perhaps a set of key technologies that from industry we look to to say what, what it would take to, to address the threats that we just talked about. And this is a range of these, and I won't talk about these in any detail, but because again, we could actually fill the page with these technologies and talk about them all day. But just to hit a couple of here. here. First of all, directed energy, critically important. We have been talking about directed energy being the thing now for a long, long time. It's always been three to five years away. I would suggest to you now it's actually closer than that and it's critical that we deploy it rapidly. Uh, the economics of putting a $2, or a $2 million dollar missile on a $200 UAV, it just is not sustainable. So we have to quickly develop this capability and field it. I mentioned hypersonics. It's important that we have the, the ability to keep our adversaries at risk with our own hypersonic strike, but I think more importantly for all of us is to have the ability to counter those hypersonics, to find the sensing technologies to track and quickly discover where those weapons are going and to alert the right units and be able to narrow our focus 
for our ground-based systems to be able to detect and eventually destroy those. So critical technologies, again, on the upper end and the lower end, detection is critically important. Uh, autonomy uh, and um, goes, goes very well, I think, with, with cyber, EW, and, the five, and 5G. These are all technologies that are required to ensure that we have secure networks to pass all the data that we need back and forth between systems, which I'll talk about here in just a moment. But um, we, we, like, we want to draw upon commercial technologies everywhere we can. Unfortunately, oftentimes, those commercial technologies are not designed to be secure, and they're not designed to be survivable in the face of what our adversaries will throw at them in terms of, in terms of disruption. So it's key to be able to build high-capacity networks to pass that data in a secure way and in a way that is not disrupted. Uh, and, and so let me just tie the technologies in with, uh, with one last chart this morning. Uh, as we see it, here are, here are four, at least four of the keys uh, going forward to address those threats and apply those technologies in ways that, that give us the advantage or at least allow us to prevail uh, in, in future conflict. The first two go together, interoperable platforms and advanced networks. And I would suggest to you that uh, oftentimes, and I'm not the first to have said this by any means, we keep the bar pretty low for interoperable. Oftentimes we talk about, do we have radios that can actually talk to each other? And unfortunately, there, there's examples out there, and I won't call them out, but recent examples where even we don't have good radio uh, interoperability, so troops can't talk when we're deploying them from different nations. But we have to go far beyond even, even considering that to be an acceptable situation. In order to prevail in that threat environment, we have to have systems that are essentially integrated together from whatever nation uh, is allied in the effort, uh, in the particular effort. So each platform, for example, needs to be a node on a network, essentially. All data that it sees, everything that its sensors bring in, however sophisticated or however simple, need to be quickly processed and passed back to all other nodes in the network so that every node knows what every other node sees. And when, when uh, responding to these threats, these disruptions, places where our adversaries might shut down a particular communication systems or a navigation system, for example, that this network is resilient, it adjusts, it transfers, whether it be command and control, it transfers um, uh, capability, or it transfers um, responsibility to deal with certain threats between elements of that node. Now, that's quite a leap from where we are now. It means, again, building those high-speed networks with, with common standards and some set of common equipment, if not some sort of translation that goes between that, that common equipment, in ways that each, each one of those nodes can operate, not independently, but in an integrated whole. Uh, if, if, we can, if we can integrate the systems together in this way, we can take and ensure that, that uh, the synergy of, the, of the, the systems as we apply to the threats can actually respond to uh, what we see evolving now. And, and I would tell you that all of the modeling that we do, all the assessments that we do, um, suggest that if we don't do this, we will not prevail against the threat landscape that is already deployed today, much less what might be deployed in five or 10 years from now. So it's really not a matter of should we move in this direction of, of integrated systems, uh, in, uh, systems that are, that are effectively uh, managing uh, between and auto uh, autonomously yet integrated at the same time, but we have to do this in order to, uh, to prevail. Uh, the next item I think that is critically important for us are agile business models, and we talk about this a lot, but we have got to find ways to uh, invest differently, to bring in economic capability in multiple nations simultaneously, to share data going back and forth, both technological data uh, and capabilities. We need to be able to build economic um, and sustainable security of supply in nations, and we need to do all that in a way that doesn't take us five or 10 or 15 years uh, to field the capability. We need to be able to bring in the commercial systems where it's applicable to do it. And we need to move at a pace in which commercial industry, not national security industry, but commercial industry is interested. When we start talking about uh, systems that are going to be developed in 10 years and 15 years before deployment, Getting, getting companies like AT&T, for example, very difficult to do, or Microsoft, very difficult to do. So finding, finding a, a rapid acquisition approach that meets that mission need, as well as draws in uh, commercial industry and draws in industry from around the world in a way that is synergistic 
is critically important. We're just going to have to think a little bit differently about the models that we use to achieve those goals. And finally, I would say uh, what you hear a lot about, uh, you've heard today already this morning, you've heard it here over the last couple of days, is the criticality of the partnerships. Finding the convergence of national need for, for national security, national need for economics, and the business case for industry is critically important. And when we find those three converging, we should leap on that quickly and, and make the investments and make the decisions that we need to go make those things happen. Um, if we don't work in partnership, if we don't find ways to draw upon supply chains from around the world, again, we will not be successful. We are not drawing upon all of the strengths that we have in all of the corners of the planet that could contribute. Um, we're not bringing it to the fight. And we can't afford to not bring everything that we have uh, to this fight. So with that, I will stop there and, and let you hear from our distinguished panel and turn it back to Samir. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk with you this morning. Thank you, Tim. Uh, the Honorable Minister of State will now uh, leave the auditorium, but let me, uh, while she leaves us, let me thank her for joining us this morning, ma'am, for your address. And uh, let me also invite the next panel on the stage as we get the conversations going. Uh, please applaud the minister and please applaud the incoming panel as well. So let me invite uh, Lisa Singh, Director and CEO, Australia India Institute. Uh, she's going to be now in charge of uh, the most formidable uh, fighting force assembled on the stage. And we are also trying to uh, create a bridge between the French and the Quad. It's been a little testy in recent days. Uh, so let me invite Admiral R. Hari Kumar uh, from Chief of the Naval Staff India, General Agnes Campbell, Chief of Defence Force Australia, General Koji Yamazaki, uh, Chief of Staff, Joint Staff, Japan Self-Defence Forces, and of course, Admiral John Aquilino, Commander, U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. Thank you, Samir. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It gives me great pleasure to be here with this incredibly esteemed panel for our topic for today, Sabras of Silicon, Reassessing a 21st Century Global Risk Landscape. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to advance this conversation this morning about the understanding of the nexus between our global security environment and technology, and indeed how current and emerging technologies are shaping how assess our assessments of risk, alliances, and national security. Of course, the 21st century has brought with it threats to the global order, which exist, as the minister has said this morning, not only in the open, but also, as we have seen recently, with Russia's invasion in Ukraine, also in the shadows and in the form of cyber attacks, supply chain disruptions, the shortage of critical minerals, the proliferation of lethal autonomous weapons systems, and the weaponization of domestic socio-political cleavages. Yet many of these risks and challenges in our global security environment are shared. So one of the questions I want to explore in today's session is how countries such as those represented here today can come together in today's age of dangerous tech to help build trust, resilience, and stability in the Indo-Pacific region. Before I introduce our panelists, I would like to pay my respects to the memory of General Bipin Wawat. Particularly, I would like to acknowledge the Indian Army who, that has set up a chair of excellence at the United Service Institution of India, India in memory of General Warat, who tragically died last year. He was someone who led the Indian Armed Forces into a new era of transformation, and this chair of excellence and all the efforts of the Indian Army will no doubt ensure his legacy lives on. Now, without further ado, let me introduce our high-level panel. Admiral Hari Kumar, Chief of the Naval Staff, India. General Angus Campbell, Chief of the Defence Force, Australia. 
General Koji Yamakazi, Chief of Staff, Joint, of Star, Joint Staff Japan Self-Defence Forces. Admiral John C. Aquilino, Commander, US Indo-Pacific Command. And Air Marshal Luc de Lancourt, Deputy Director General for International Affairs and Strategy, France. Welcome, gentlemen. Well, we have five nation, democratic nations here, but I think we should get straight in, and I would like to start by opening to, to um, General, to Admiral Harry Kumar. We've recently seen Admiral, you know, we've witnessed the impact of the withdrawal of the US and, and allied forces from Afghanistan and the redrawing of the Iron Curtain over Europe, which has thrown us back into, some would say, a bipolar Cold War world order. It seems that the breakdown of this global order has a direct connection to the flow of technologies and the division of the world into different technological blocks. So what does this new unknown world order have in store for us? And will these shared threats foster more cooperation between our, uh, ourselves as international partners, or will we see a new zero-sum game dominate? Uh, thank you for the question. And uh, let me first of all thank the ORF for giving me this opportunity to participate in this, uh, uh, in this uh, event along with so many esteemed panelists who are present here. Uh, it's good to be in this uh, uh, format where we interact rather than the virtual format which is forced upon us over the last two years. Uh, I would like to start with saying that uh, we are, the way we, uh, we see the 21st century, it's a, uh, we are in a uh, contested present and uh, moving on to quite an uncertain future. And uh, why is this so? Uh, it's primarily because of the conflict that we see as well as the challenges that are uh, thrown in by uh, the technologies uh, which are emerging in various domains. The uh, technology uh, indeed has divided us into uh, different blocks depending upon our you know, level of development. But in uh, my assessment, uh, this is a, uh, not a zero-sum game. It, is, it offers great opportunity for uh, cooperation and collaboration. Uh, I can name two examples. If you look at how uh, we uh, combated the COVID challenge, all the nations came together, they pulled in uh, their skills, their technology to develop the vaccine. So that's a great example of, you know, collaboration as well as cooperation. The second that comes to mind is the uh, International Solar Alliance, where again uh, the nations have come together to combat the uh, uh, climate change. So there is, uh, I'm convinced that it's not a zero-sum game and there is uh, much scope for uh, cooperation, especially between like-minded uh, countries like those which are represented on this panel. Uh, our Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi had uh, spoken at the Sydney Dialogue where he said that how a nation uses technology depends upon its vision and its values. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fact that uh, the uh, democratic nations have always been forthcoming and uh, uh, restrained in the way the technology is used. Uh, at the uh, Quad last year, there was a declaration on the use of technology where it was said that the, te the technology design, development, uh, governance and use uh, need to be uh, worked out 
you know, and that approach underlined the principles of uh, democratic values as well as respect for the uh, international uh, uh, human rights. So this is the type of approach uh, that needs to be uh, taken forward and uh, I see close cooperation uh, between like-minded nations in the field of technology. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Admiral. Air Marshal Durankur, how do you see the, these current um, unknown world order sort of landscape that we currently face? Do you see it as a, an era of new cooperation or is it going to be more of a, a zero-sum game? Well, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, the, uh, I, I see two, two points, uh, especially related to the theme of, of that panel. The, the first one is, does uh, technology change uh, the way we wage war? Uh, and for that, uh, I, I feel that uh, the uh, key principle, the key uh, strategic principle uh, won't, uh, won't change. What uh, really does change is, uh, first, the, the tools uh, which are available to uh, any uh, stakeholder in any con conflict, uh, which uh, are uh, especially uh, very important uh, due to the, uh, um, uh, the, re the revolution in the, in the digital uh, domain, which empower lots of uh, new uh, stakeholders. Uh, so, uh, since uh, we have a, a very wide variety of tools, uh, we also have a wide variety of stakeholders, and uh, the conflicts uh, are now uh, involving uh, a lot of uh, different domains that we need to take, uh, uh, that we have to take into account, uh, be it political, be it diplomatical, economical, uh, be it military, of course, and also be uh, so, uh, societal. Uh, and uh, one uh, thing which, which strikes me about Ukraine is just not the, the aspect of technology, but also the, the aspect of what we call force morale in France. Uh, and uh, it all boils down with the resilience of, of your society. So that's what one point. The second point about international relations uh, system, uh, what, do, what do we really want? Uh, do we really want uh, a world uh, where uh, we uh, relish uh, the logical uh, that uh, betrays the international relations system is uh, under the logical of a zero-sum sum game? And that kind of logical fuels secu security dilemma. It fuels arms race. It fuels uh, lots of things like, like that. Or do we want uh, to stand up for our values? Do we want to uh, keep uh, what have uh, so far uh, maintained the uh, equilibrium and the balance among uh, uh, nations uh, worldwide? I mean, multilateralism, partnership, uh, uh, and so on. So uh, I think that the way uh, we will uh, stand up for uh, those values uh, will be uh, the, uh, the way we'll be able to tame the violence uh, which uh, uh, underpin the, uh, the current uh, international relations system. Uh, well, let's just get into that a bit more. I mean, I think we, what we've witnessed with the Russian invasion on Ukraine is, is definitely the changing nature of warfare. And I really want to ask the panel what that changing nature of warfare does look like, what the future of defence technologies looks like off the back of that. We've, we know there's a range of threats today, cyber attacks, uh, the proliferation of lethal autonomous weapons systems. Um, so should the, all of this give militaries a pause for thought in terms of should militaries be spending billions of dollars on, say, tanks? Or do you think there should be a change of focus on what military equipment counts as a strategic priority in this new changing nature of warfare? and in terms of what they're invested in. I might ask uh, General Yamakazi uh, this first. Thank you very much. 
for your such a kind uh, introduction. あのまずあの、えー、あのロシアにおけるウクライナ侵攻についてはあの、えー、主権領土の一体性を課すあの国際秩序、えー、への挑戦であり国際秩序を崩壊する暴挙であるということで、まあえー、を思ってますししっかり我々はこれからしっかりとしたあの教訓を学ばなければならないと思ってます。I consider that, uh... Russia's invasion to Ukraine is a clear violation、uh, to the、uh, international rule based order、uh, to violate the、um, sovereignty as well as、uh, territorial integrity,、uh, which is、uh, challenging the、uh, very foundation of international order. And actually,、uh, it is the act to、uh, collapse、uh, that、uh, international order. And therefore, Uh, we must uh, learn uh, from uh, this uh, war uh, to acquire、uh, lessons learned as well. えっとまず、えー、このしっかりとこの法と秩序を、えー、犯す力による現状の変化を絶対許さないという意思と、えー、その能力を構築しなければならないというふうに思います。Uh, first of all,、uh, we should not、uh, allow any.、Um, Unilateral attempts to change the status quo. And that will and determination needs to be clearly demonstrated. And also,、uh, we must acquire the capability、uh, to prevent any of those attempts. ウクライナ侵攻、ウクライナにおけるウコ紛争においてはですね、あの陸、海空の従来領域に加えまして、えー、宇宙、サイバー,あーと、またこれに加えてあの情報戦、えーまあ、認知領域の戦いということが行われています。In a uh, conflict uh, of uh, Ukraine, that,、uh, not only the,、uh, within the conventional、uh, domain of the、uh, ground maritime air, there has been、uh, a warfare taking place. Uh, within the、uh, new domains such as outer space, cyber, and as well as uh, today, uh, we see uh, those uh, activities and then the warfare in the information domains as an information operation as well as cognitive warfare. あの力による抑止力、これはとても重要でありますが、あのそれに加えまして、今回につきましては、そのインターネット、SNS を使ったあその認知領域の戦いということが、このニューテクノロジーにおいて行われてきています。It is important to、uh, have a deterrence by strength and then force, but in this conflict,、uh, we see all those、uh, internet activities as well as the SNS、uh, type of Uh, attempts as the、uh, cognitive warfare uh, applied uh, by the uh, uh, new technology. え取り入れて新しい戦い方をし、領域横断作戦をしっかりとするかということがポイントになってきています。So under the、um, cyber warfare environment, how are you going to preserve and maintain our、uh, C2 capability and then thank,、uh, sanctions in order to、uh, continue our、uh, combat battle is also another、uh, challenge.、Uh, therefore, how are you going to、uh, introduce and then apply those Uh, new technologies、uh, into our、uh, new way of how to fight,、uh, and also、uh, in order to、uh, realize the cross domain、uh, type of、uh, battle and an operation、uh, will be the key. あの認知領域の戦いにおいては、しっかりとこのウクライナによって、その意思とそのこの攻撃によってもたらされている国民の。その悲惨さというものを訴えながら、そしていかにしてその主権を守るかという戦いをしております。So I see under the、uh, cognitive warfare,、uh, Ukraine、uh, clearly demonstrate and show their determination and will 
under this uh, invasion and, and uh, uh, offensive uh, action uh, from the uh, adversary uh, to show the uh, reality of the uh, sorrow of the uh, uh, people of that uh, country uh, in order to protect their own sovereignty. またその偽情報があの飛び交いながらその真の情報は何かということも新徳テクノロジーと技術によって明らかにするということが求められています。真実偽情報偽情報真の偽情報。So uh, also uh, in this domain,、uh, it is、uh, important to、uh, differentiate the、uh, disinformation and then the truth and the facts.、Uh, these kind of uh, uh, The、uh, effort、uh, will be the key as well. よってあの新技術をいかにして、えー、陸、海空、従来領域、また宇宙、サイバー、電子戦、また情報戦においていかに取り組んで、えー、この我々のその意思を、表示をし、戦い抜くかという戦い方と装備をしっかりと持ち、またあの多国間においてよく連携を取り、相乗効果により、えー、防衛体制を作るということが求められているのが教訓であると思います。And so, uh, uh, in this regard, in terms of the、uh, new technology,、uh, alongside with the uh, uh, conventional uh, domains of mari-、uh, maritime and air,、uh, new domains of the uh, space uh, uh, cyber, uh, also uh, uh, electric, electric warfare, and then, uh, uh, all those、uh, information operations and so forth,、uh, we must clearly. Demonstrate our will and then the capability uh, to uh, also uh, need to、uh, strengthen our own、uh, the defense posture as well as the、uh, equipment、uh, based on that fact and then the,、uh, the lessons what we have learned、uh, in order to、uh, closely、uh, corroborate、uh, with all those、uh, countries in terms of the、uh, multi. Lateralism to uh, uh, create the、uh, synergy effect uh, to firmly uh, defend ourselves uh, based on the、uh, strength and、uh, posture of defense. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Admiral Aquilino, we just heard from General Yamakazi talk about off, off, you know, looking at the, the outcomes of the, the Ukraine war, that there is a need. To, to have new technologies, a new way of, do, of, of doing warfare, new capabilities. How do you see this going forward as, in terms of you know, the Ukraine war outcome? Is this giving the United States pause for thought in terms of what are the sorts of defence technologies and capabilities that are going to be needed into the future for these sorts of conflicts? Uh, thanks, Lisa, and I'm honored to be here with my、uh, friends from across the globe.、Uh, I also want to recognize、uh, the loss of General Rawat.、Uh, he was a good friend.、Um, uh, you know, th- there are like minded nations sitting at this desk up here, up here at the panel.、Uh, we are all concerned about what we've watched in the Ukraine.、Uh, we've watched、uh, unprovoked. Action、uh, to generate a war.、Uh, and as I've said before,、uh, this is a very concerning time as I look through the lens of global security.、Uh, that's based on that action from the Russians.、Uh, it's amplified when I look and listen to the comments by the PRC with regard to no limits between those two nations.、Uh, that gives me great concern for the future. And I think. What has to happen and what you're watching is this set of like minded nations and others from around the region and the globe come together,、uh, utilizing all forms of technology、uh, to be able to deliver what my secretary calls integrated deterrence.、Uh, the utilization of all forms of national power、uh, in all domains combined with our allies and partners to prevent conflict. And that's what this panel is doing each and every day. Along with our other like minded partners. We're operating together,、uh, we're becoming interoperable, we're sharing information, we're sharing technologies, all towards the delivery of、uh, a conflict free and a free and open Indo Pacific. Thank you very much, Admiral. 
General Campbell, I wanted to ask you if you wanted to respond to this question as well, but also in terms of, I know you've, you've talked in the past about you know, the, the, what, you know, what military experts call the, the grey zone tactics. Uh, grey zone tactics meaning disinformation campaigns, cyber operations, intellectual property theft, coercion and propaganda. How have, you know, how these are sort of calibrating in such a way that they often fall short of, of a response? So how have countries increased their understanding uh, for Australia with its partners here, for example, on these sorts of tactics? And what are the most effective strategies in responding to, to such attacks as we've seen carried out through the Ukraine war? Uh, thanks, Lisa. And I think the technology and a will to apply that technology in novel, coercive ways is really what we're talking about in the grey zone. And we see it now uh, being used uh, quite widely, and particularly by assertive authoritarian powers without regard for the rule of law, uh, the international order, free and open Indo-Pacific, the respect for territorial integrity and sovereignty and so forth. Now, I can understand why there's an attraction to essentially seeking to win without fighting. We, I think, uh, in the community of nations here, describe that as diplomacy. Uh, that's the way we work together to pursue our interests. Uh, where it moves into the grey zone of coercive behaviours, uh, I think the most appropriate response is to generate and become practised at the comprehensive application of our national powers in partnership. We're always stronger together, whether it's between agencies of our own nations or across nations. And to use to use the sunlight of uh, revealed information to expose these kinds of behaviours. And I, I would commend the United States' efforts with regard to the war in Ukraine in comprehensively undermining attempts by Russia at false flag programmes and uh, plots to purport that, the, that Ukraine uh, was the aggressor. Utter rubbish and with the really careful release of information, I think that that was magnificently done uh, to counter what would otherwise have been a very manipulative and very intentional effort through a grey zone tactic. Now, we are all learning as technology evolves and changes. We've got to keep true to the maintenance of a moral authority, uh, but we have to be innovative and find ways to counter and to demonstrate strength because it is strength that is respected by authoritarian powers and to be prepared uh, to expose behaviours when it's appropriate. Thank you. Absolutely. Look, I wanted to ask um, uh, Admiral Kumar, um, bringing this back to our region for a moment, uh, as the Chief of the Naval Staff, you've expressed that India is the preferred security partner in the, Indo, in the Indian Ocean. Uh, you know, it's a region obviously that's been elevated in the strategic consciousness of both literal and non-literal states. What do you see as the main drivers for deepening cooperation in the Indian Ocean region? And what, what role will defence technologies play in these waters? Uh, we have been given very clear political direction by our Honourable Prime Minister by the articulation of Saga, which is, uh, Saga means ocean, but uh, it's an acronym for security and growth for all in the region. Uh, so this works on, uh, you know, five principles. It's called the five S's, which is uh, uh, Saman, which stands for respect, Samvad for dialogue, Sahyog for cooperation, uh, Shanti for peace, and Samriti for prosperity. 
So these uh, five principles underlie uh, the way we interact in the region uh, and uh, uh, we reach out to all the, uh, the smaller countries uh, of the Indian Ocean region. Now, uh, why do we reach out and why are we, why are we there? Uh, Admiral Mahan talked of the tyranny of distance at sea. Uh, that is, you know, uh, it takes a finite amount of time to, to, for a ship to travel and, you know, reach a particular destination. So, therefore, we are closer to all the neighbors. And uh, in all the, uh, uh, at the times of crisis, uh, we've been able to respond uh, with alacrity and try to be the first responders to assist them. So, uh, how does it help? It uh, helps in uh, developing trust. It helps in uh, interoperability, uh, learning best practices from each other. Even a smaller uh, nation in the Indian Ocean has the has, uh, knowledge of the region, of its the peculiarities of the domain uh, affecting them. So there is a fair amount of uh, exchange of good practices. Uh, then there is uh, domain awareness. Uh, we also have uh, engagements uh, in uh, exercises, in uh, other activities. Uh, and finally, all this translates into maritime security. Uh, this, uh, this concept of saga, uh, it's akin to saying that, uh, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. So uh, when uh, the intention is for everybody to prosper together from the benefits of achieving uh, maritime security. And uh, uh, it has been articulated many times by uh, uh, senior admirals of the uh, United States as well. It's almost impossible for any one country to ensure maritime security. Uh, in fact, the concept of a thousand ship Navy, uh, including, uh, uh, you know, navies from, you know, various countries being pulled together to arrive at maritime security has been articulated. So therefore, you know, I would say that uh, it's almost impossible for uh, uh, any country to ensure maritime security on its own. So therefore, there's a need for uh, cooperation, collaboration, interaction, interoperability, and all this to fall in place so that collectively we can ensure peace for the benefit of all of us. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I do love the way India uses acronyms with such meaning. And uh, Sagar, that's an, an, another one that I've learnt today. Um, Admiral Aquilina, I wanted to ask you about that in terms of the Indo-Pacific region, moving, you know, from, from what you have said about the invasion of Ukraine, that it, it could, you, I think you said that it signalled that it could happen, really happen in this region as well. So I, I sort of wanted to explore that with you. It, I think you said we shouldn't be complacent, we need to be prepared at all times. So is conflict in our region much closer than we think? Uh, is it is something we can prepare for in terms of if we cannot see it, when we're thinking about, uh, you know, cyber warfare, for example? Uh, how do you see this sort of hidden nature of, of cyber warfare and, and what do we need to do to prepare in our own region here in the Indo-Pacific? Yeah, thanks, Lisa. So, you know, uh, cyber is just a part of it, right? As we talked about before, all, all forms of technology apply in the military sphere and all nations uh, are utilizing every aspect to try to gain an advantage. Uh, you know, uh, Admiral Kumar, I think, articulated very clearly uh, some of those things that we need to be doing and we do need to prepare. Uh, we need to prepare with a sense of urgency. Uh, again, the most dangerous time in my lifetime, and I could argue the most dangerous time uh, since World War II, we are sitting in the middle of it. Uh, but some of the things that we do do is we operate together all the time. We exercise together, whether it's Talisman Sabre, uh, whether it's uh, Malabar, Keen Edge, La Perouse, to name the exercises that we all do together. And we all agreed that we would work to make them all increased in, an ult in a multilateral sense. So where we previously worked bilaterally mostly, we're expanding that to operate multilaterally. That allows us to work those technologies in the forms of command and control, battle space awareness, uh, fires, all aspects of our business synchronized together with like-minded nations, uh, all the while for the common goals of 
uh, equal voice by all nations, large and small, coercion-free uh, resolution of disputes peacefully, right? So let's never forget why we do this. Uh, and again, our common values and interests bring, our, bring us together. Our people-to-people -to -people ties bring us together. Uh, so we take this on each and every day, and those are just some examples of how we do it. Mm. France, obviously, currently the, the chair of the EU. Um, what's the role of the EU in the Indo-Pacific right now? Well, <clears throat> Uh, so, uh, as, uh, as you just said, the, uh, France is now uh, having the presidency of the, uh, of the EU. Uh, and uh, during that uh, presidency, uh, uh, one important uh, document has been endorsed, uh, which is called the uh, Strategic Compass. Uh, Strategic Compass uh, uh, highlight uh, four uh, domains which are, uh, which are uh, roughly act, secure, invest, and partnership. Uh, for partnership, uh, there is an important point uh, which has been also uh, delivered at the end of the uh, beginning of the fall uh, 220, uh, which is the Indo-Pacific, Indo uh, the EU Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, which is uh, in line with the uh, French Indo-Pacific strategy uh, that was also uh, presented uh, a, few, a few years ago. Uh, this is uh, important because, uh, as I said pr uh, previously, uh, if we uh, stand up to our va values, if we uh, want to foster uh, multilater multilateralism, uh, we need to uh, make sure that uh, uh, the connection, uh, the diplomatic connection, the economic connections uh, throughout the, the world uh, are, uh, are efficient. And you need also to have some concrete uh, initiatives. Uh, and for that, for, for instance, for that uh, Indo-Pacific, uh, for that EU Indo-Pacific strategy, I can mention the uh, enhance in security uh, in and with Asia. Uh, which deals mainly with cyber, with counterterrorism, and, and so on. Which is important is that uh, with Asia, which means that the links are both ways. Uh, I can also mention uh, Climario uh, initiative, which is uh, uh, about uh, criminal uh, maritime uh, issues. Uh, so. Uh, by having uh, those uh, close, uh, close links, uh, we also make sure that we are in a position to anticipate any uh, hostile uh, maneuver from uh, other competitors, uh, because uh, it also uh, fuels, as it was, uh, as it was said, uh, truth among, uh, among partners, uh, among allies. Uh, it also uh, fuels uh, better information sharing, uh, and so uh, a capacity to better anticipate what could uh, occur. Thank you. Look, I, I have a number of other questions that I could ask the panel, but in the essence of time, I do want to open it up to the floor and, and, uh, and see if there are uh, any um, individuals on the floor that would like to ask our esteemed panel of, of defence um, personnel a question from either any of the five uh, countries or indeed a general question. I would ask you though to refrain from giving comments. Uh, this is an opportunity to ask a question to our defence uh, panel. Um, so if, if you would like to raise your hand and, and I think there might be a microphone that is coming yeah, around. Hello, um, I'm Arif Nizami from Bangladesh. It was a great discussion. So I have basically two questions, very short. One is, um, as I mean, I'm from Bangladesh, so Quad is being here. So what is your strategy of partnering up with the other countries, like sharing technology? That is number one. And number two is after we all know the Pegasus software issue that came up in front of the world. So what is the changes that happened you know, on moral grounds of using those kind of software to uh, use for security reasons, or also for like internal uh, issues as well. Thank you. General Campbell, I might start with you on that. 
I think we, we are, and, and I think I would speak for all my colleagues here on the panel, uh, we are very keen to be working with partners all across the region. The Indo-Pacific is a region for all the nations of the Indo-Pacific. And uh, we're better off when we are working together, we understand each other, we find it comfortable uh, to support and assist each other and to uh, be able to respond to unexpected events uh, across a wide range of issues that the military might uh, be required to uh, be involved in, including combat operations, but humanitarian assistance, climate change, all sorts of things. So the idea of um, seeing minilaterals and multilaterals and nations coming together, that is very welcome. And I think it is, it's increasingly the reality of the nations here uh, reaching out and multilateralizing our activities. Now, unfortunately, I didn't catch the second part of the question. Peg Pegasus? Yeah, so uh, last few months, uh, there was a big issue of a software from an Israeli firm called Pegasus. So many you know, armies are using it for many security reasons. Yeah. So what, is, what changes are being there for you know, moral ground on using those kind of like cyber security tool for internal matters and also for like global audience as well? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to pass and phone a friend. <laughs> I, I, I'm not up to uh, date on, on that issue. Look, we might, we might hold on, uh, unless a, a panellist wants a specific answer, we might hold over because we, I know there's a number of questions, we've got a limited amount of time, but thank you for that, for that informed question. Oh, hi. Our next, go. Um, my name's Emma Connors, I'm from the Australian Financial Review, and I have a question for all the panel, but perhaps mostly for, um, General Campbell and Admiral Aquilino, you've both spoken about increased multilateral um, exercises among like-minded nations. China has repeatedly come out and said there is a NATO building in the Indo-Pacific. How do you respond to that? Where does multilateralism stop short of a military alliance? Thank you. I might go to, Jen, uh, yeah, to Admiral Aquilino on that first. There's a lot of things the PRC accuses people of that are not necessarily factual, so let me start with that. Uh, what I would say is like-minded nations in the Indo-Pacific have been working together for 80 years. Uh, what we've seen is the benefit of when like-minded nations come together as an example from the uh, increased strength that we've seen in NATO based on uh, the Russian actions. I would articulate that that's uh, a pretty good model for the Indo-Pacific, for those nations who value freedom, uh, again, our values and our interests, uh, to keep peace and prosperity in the region is a pretty good thing. So uh, will you see increased minilateral, multilateral events from the partner nations, both in the region and out of the region? Absolutely. Uh, for the United States, the uh, RIMPAC exercises coming up. Over 27 nations from across the globe will come together to operate peacefully in order to keep uh, and ensure freedom of navigation, freedom of the global commons, uh, for the benefit of all nations. Uh, so if, if, if there's an accusation there, uh, I'm not, first of all, I don't believe it's valid. Second, all nations get a choice, a sovereign choice on what they'd like to do with other nations. Uh, and if nations want to come together, to provide security and prosperity, then uh, I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I look forward. I look forward. I, yeah, I think I look forward to my counterpart raising the issue with me when he might next wish to speak with me. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we'll move on to the next question on that note. <laughs> yes. Okay. Sorry, I think um, I was first. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Dominic. Okay. Yeah. You've got the floor. Okay, thank you so much because I just, you know, like. Sorry, it's hard to see my my director. Sure, <laughs> it's okay. Thank you. Apologies for the inconvenience. Uh, my name is Elizabeth. I am part of the Resina Young Fellows, so I think that we should also like be given the opportunity to speak up here. I'm also head of the project, the International Panel on the Regulation of Autonomous Weapons, funded by the German Foreign Office. 
And I just had a question combined with a short comment. Um, I would like to hear a few more words about whether you really think that the war in Ukraine has changed the nature of warfare. Because what I can see is that the technology that is now being deployed is nothing new. We have drones, which have been used in the past. Uh, we have loitering munition, which does not really, um, like, uh, does not fulfill the criteria for real lethal autonomous weapon system, according to, like, how I understand the term uh, lethal autonomous weapon system. And when we talk about hypersonics, the, the te technology was used by Russia more or less reflects um, an airborne as kind of short range missile. So do we really think it has changed or does the narrative change that we are more willing to accept the use of technology such as drones and loitering munitions on the battlefield? Because in the past, when we think about um, Afghanistan and still in Yemen, drones, especially in non-international armed conflict, were condemned and criticized heavily. And now we see a change in narrative. I would like to hear more in this regard. Thank you very much. Great question. General Campbell? Thank you very much. I know my colleagues will wish to speak on this. I'll be very quick. Uh, I uh, accept the broad premise that there is much that is familiar and then there are new or unexpected aspects of the war in Ukraine across five domains, land, air, sea, space and cyber. But I'm reminded of Napoleon's uh, 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 comment that uh, morale is too material as three is to one, and the Ukrainians are demonstrating that in spades. A magnificent effort. And then I'm also reminded that war brutally uh, deals with tactical incompetence. And uh, rather than the question of which weapon system is more or less appropriate in which circumstance, no weapon system is... Uh, uh, appropriate in circumstance where it's tactically incompetently employed. And we saw a lot of that early on in the campaign by the Russians. Uh, but you're quite right, it is a brutal conflict. The Ukrainians are fighting magnificently, uh, but the Russians are now moving into a phase where it looks awfully like the advance on the Eastern Front. Thank you. General Kamal? Uh, I would like to make a couple of uh, quick comments. Uh, firstly, I would like to say that the, it is the character of war that has changed, uh, classic Clausewitz, and uh, not the nature. The nature is, uh, is brutal, it's gory, and you know, that's the way uh, we see it happening in Ukraine. Uh, secondly, with, re with regard to uh, the competing technologies, I'd like to uh, highlight what the old, uh, you know, Spartan father had to say to his son, who said that, you know, father, my sword is short. So he said, add a step to it. So that's probably what the Ukrainians are doing, uh, you know, doing better at the tactical level. So uh, weapons, uh, superiority between weapons will always be there. And uh, we need to find, you know, ways and means of uh, exploiting them in the best manner possible. Thank you. あの、ちょっとあの、え、ショートコメントいたします。あの、技術力は、やっぱ国語力の質素であり、え、技術力によって、その戦い方、装備は変わります。あ、で、just a short comment. Uh, those technologies is part of uh, uh, the defense force uh, of the nation. And then uh, uh, the uh, technology also uh, changes the, our uh, uh, equipment as well as the uh, way of fight. あの、例えばあの、HGV Eto, well, actually, uh, Japan is uh, facing uh, uh, hypersonic uh, glide, uh, gliding vehicles type of uh, uh, threat. And then also, we've seen all those uh, highly lofted uh, type of trajectories uh, that are uh, facing as our own national threat as well. 
あのそれを対応するためにはいかにしてもう宇宙領域も使ったまた突入上のレーダーシステムも使った部分で、えー、その弾道ミサイルをいかにして探知をするのかまた追尾するのかまた迎撃システムをどのようにするかということをしっかりと考えなければいけません。So, uh... In order to deal with, dealing with these kind of、uh, events and situations,、uh, we are now、uh, putting our efforts to、uh, further、uh, strengthening the、uh, capability in the、uh, space uh, and then uh, uh, also uh, the communication uh, capability,、uh, including the radar, as to uh, identify uh, that, uh, uh, the objects as well as how we are going to、uh, track those. Uh, projectiles,、um, and then also uh, uh, this kind of like a relaying system and, and so forth. We are now also struggling to uh, further uh, enhancing our capability and technology. このようなあの防衛体制、あの装備体系を作るためには、あのしっかりとした研究開発と実証研究、実験等がありますけれども、それはあの一国のみでは、えー、やるよりもこの、えーこのライクマインドのカントリーの中の技術力を持った国同士が共同開発、共同の訓練等を実施をすることによって、いち早くそのような脅威に対応できることができると思います。In order to build such kind of defense posture, it is necessary to also explore the R&D as well as we must carry out experimental Uh, the、uh, activities and tests. But、uh, this kind of effort cannot be dealt、uh, by a single country alone. So it is necessary to closely work with、uh, like minded countries and partners who have these kind of technologies.、Uh, therefore, it is necessary to have those uh, multilateral uh, type of、uh, joint exercise and, and engagements uh, in order to uh, uh, cope with these kind of threats and, and、uh, events. Uh, in an agile manner. Thank you, General. I, I would like to just take the final three questions as a group lot. We are almost out of time, and then we'll see if we can get a,、uh, some, some response from our panel. So I'll start with the gentleman there. Thank you. My name is Dominic. I'm from Ivory Coast, and I'm based in Ghana.、Um, basically, my question is about how broad is the cooperation and also how we anticipate. We can clearly see that the, the war which is happening between Russia and Ukraine is having an economical and social impact in Europe, but not only. Also in Africa, where I live in Ghana, the crisis of oil has doubled, for example. And crisis starts from social frustrations, mainly. In Africa, where Daesh is active, and Boko Haram is also active, with a gap and disruption in access to new technology, how do we anticipate crisis which might happen on that continent? Where it has also an impact with migration and all the stuff in Europe, for example. Thank you. Yes, this lady. Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm Colonel Mary Eisen. I'm from Israel. I stand in front of all these admirals and generals with immense.、Uh, I wonder,、um, Campbell, um, General Campbell, you said, and I quote,、um, you need to demonstrate strength、um, which is respected by authoritarian powers. And I say that because all I've heard from the five of you are amazing words of partnership and cooperation. And yet, you said the term, you have to demonstrate strength to be respected by authoritarian powers. Perhaps it's in con continuation to what the young man just said from the Ivory Coast. At the end, if you don't demonstrate strength, how do you deter a Russia? How do you deter the other type of terrorist organizations that are mentioned in Africa? It's not going to be through cooperation or partnership. Thank you. Yes. I'm Fei Fanding from、uh, Taiwan delegation. I'm、um, Deputy Secretary General of the DPP, the current governing party in Taiwan.、Uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, the first,、uh, first of all, I want to say that the,、uh, Taiwan shares the same, exact same values with the、uh, democracies on the stage, I, I believe.、Uh, we do recent years、uh, do a lot of preparation on the developing our asymmetric, uh, asymmetric uh, defense capability. capability. That's what we are trying to do from 2016 to now. But I would like to ask is there any more room s or space for Taiwan to participate in the、uh, allies、uh, on the stage that in the military cooperation or any training system or any kind of fields that Taiwan can participate in this process? Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Look, they were all really good questions. We are out of time. So I will ask uh, any of the, the panel whether they wish to respond to, to those questions as a group lot, particularly around demonstrating strength and, um, and perhaps also Taiwan. So uh, yeah, first, I'll Adam. jump in, if you don't mind, on, yep. the, on the strength issue. I don't see them as separate. You, the question articulated them is either you have strength or you have partnership. And I would articulate that one yields the other. And that's the approach that we've taken through many and multilateral uh, operations. Again, the sharing of information, uh, the cooperation and coordination and rehearsal that we do in exercises, uh, to me, that yields strength. So uh, I just don't see them as separate. Thank you. I might, uh, I might uh, answer also uh, for the uh, question about uh, Africa. Uh, I think that the, uh, this ocean is, is not only a military solution. Uh, and uh, as we are uh, working uh, in Africa, uh, we try to work in, uh, with uh, four, four different pillars. Uh, one pillar is uh, bringing security, which is uh, paramount, but it's also uh, bringing uh, back the uh, authority of states and uh, buttressing uh, development. Uh, and also, uh, military alone cannot uh, solve uh, any, uh, any, any problem or anticipate any crisis. Uh, so therefore, even for uh, any crisis worldwide, you need to have that connection between, uh, as I said, diplomatical, political, military, and economical fields. あのえー、ではショートコメントで、まあ、我々は本当に現在をあの起こっているその事象をしっかりと直面をしている事象をしっかりと真正面から捉えることが必要だと思います。Just a short comment.、Uh, what we have seen as a phenomenon and events right now,、uh, we must、uh, directly and straightforward、uh, ways that we must see the fact. まあ、我々のおえ目指すところはあ、誰もが反映をし、平和を享受し、まあ、法律支持に基づくインド、自由で開かれたインド太平洋をこの地区にこの実現をすることです。So our ultimate goal is to、uh, realize and preserve the、uh, every nations and the people in this region be prosperous,、uh, enjoy peace. As well as、uh, living based on the、uh, rule of law uh, to uh, realize the free and open in the Pacific. So we must not. Accept any、uh, unilateral change of the status quo by force.、Uh, in order to do so、uh, by ourselves and then、uh, by bilaterally as well as、uh, by the framework of multilateralism, like minded country、uh, needs to be fully uh, solidified uh, to take action. And that is what is necessary、uh, for this time and then era. And I do believe so. And then、uh, I would like to conclude my comment. Thank you so much. And thank you for our, for our, panel, for our questions to the panel. We've run out of time. It has been such an informative and、um, really insightful conversation, discussion from our five nation defence、uh, panelists here today. So please join me in thanking them in such a fantastic discussion on. The changing nature of warfare.